Hi, this is me, King Sonny Ali, all the way from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm here in America today. I'm enjoying myself and I want you to be with me and uh, enjoy yourself listening to NYC Radio Live. Hello folks, how you doing? This is NYC Radio Live. David Ellen Bogan here. Wow. Um, this is a weekly podcast, as you know. Maybe. Um, and I got... I fell off for a week. But I have the best excuse in the world. We did the 24-hour Ragas Live festival last week um over 50 musicians came and performed um it was at pioneer works with artwork from Sima lisa pandia just stunning sculptures made out of uh, recovered used tabla heads um all these amazing three-dimensional sculptures I scored a Winnebago for the backyard area just for people to come and hang out. Um, and yeah, we had speakers on the outside. So in this, during the sunrise, you could stand up and watch as the Queen Mary II, this huge uh, cruise ship pulled into the bay as Samarth Nagarkar sang. It was it was beyond, beyond, beyond. And it's all been captured. All 24 sets have been recorded in multi-track and are ready for you. Almost. They're being uh, mixed down as we speak. So I have a lot of exciting, beautiful, beautiful music. I mean, it was called a historic occasion on more than one time from more than one person. Because <laughs> um, it was also uh, broadcast over the air on WKCR-FM and uh, with partner stations as far as Timbuktu. It was it was something. And um, it was all sponsored by the Rubin Museum of Art. And I am very thankful to them because without that support, um, I do not know if it would be happening again and it seems like everybody's talking about next year it was it, it was a thing of beauty it was really great and um it was incredible to have that collaboration have the clout of uh, this great museum and um speaking of them uh they they're producing uh, quite a few great shows coming up including August 12th with none other than Awa Sango. I'm checking that as we speak. Um, and do you guys remember that podcast with Awa Sango and the Brooklyn Raga Massive All Stars? Yes, yeah, so it's August 12th at 7 p.m. It will sh- sell out because every show we've done at the Rubin has sold out. That's with Awa Sango, Danielle Moreno, Michael Gam, Arun Ramamurti, myself on guitar, Jay Gandhi and Bansuri, Kay Mathis, Mathis and Cora, Roshni, Samlal and Tava, and Malik Kohli on drum set. Um, so that's August 12th. We're going to play a little bit of uh, just a track from that to whet your appetite. And then after that, um, a great band from the West Coast that you may not have heard, or maybe you have, uh, the California Honey Drafts. They're awesome. They're playing tonight. So I thought I would re-air this interview with uh, Lesh Wazinski from, from that band, an incredible singer. There's nothing, uh, nothing more of a guaranteed good time than a California Honey Drops show. They're playing at the Knitting Factory and... Um, I I'd caught up with him uh, when they were opening up for Bonnie Raitt and 
coming through, playing the um, Epic Theater, the Beacon Theater um, on the Upper West Side. So we'll hear a little bit from Awa Sango, and then we'll hear a track from the California Honey Drops, and then that interview with Lesh Wazinski. Thanks so much for listening. I've got a stack of great episodes coming your way. It was great to meet many of you at the Rock is Live Festival, and stay tuned for all of that. All right, peace.
this energy here. I love it. All right, so that was Awa Sango recorded uh, with live with the Brooklyn Raga Massive for a concert uh, we produced at Pioneer Works. And that will be coming up August 12th at the Ruben. Same lineup, all those great musicians I mentioned before. Um, see you there. And and just listening back to this podcast, um, as I'm editing it, I realize that, yes, my voice is still completely shot from that 24-hour concert. I'm down about an octave. Um, all right. Here, let's check out uh, the California Honey Drops. They're irresistible. And then we'll have that conversation with Lesh Wazinski. They're playing tonight, Wednesday, July 27th at the Knitting Factory. All right. Peace. You don't want to run out of jail. 
just play it cool. Let her have a way till she gets through. Let her sit down on it, ride it like a pony. Boy, let her pony. Just as long as she wants it, you got to let her sit down. Um, you guys met in Berkeley Music School? Is that, is oh, that no, no. no. Uh, the band started all over the place. The original band, we started in the Bay Area. And me and the drummer, and the current drummer, both went to Oberlin uh, in Ohio okay. with, with your friend Jay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So that's that's really more like the home ground of the band is, is from that friendship. And then moving out to the Bay, we picked up a bunch of uh, musicians out in the Bay Area and played in the street a lot. For the most part, at the beginning. Ah. Yeah. Now, I've met a lot of great musicians who who got their start playing in the street. Um, or not, not get their start, but that it was like a period that they really look back on fondly. Um, yeah, definitely for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, yeah, we did it a lot. We still like to do it. We still like to come off stage and play down on the floor. And, you know, if we have some time off, sometimes we'll just still go and play in the street. It's just fun. Uh, what what about it? I mean, there's so many things are different about it and fun about it. I mean, a no one knows who you are, you know. There's no expectations. People haven't paid to see you, so you're taking them by surprise. Um, you know, you're on the ground. You're not on a stage. Uh, you can kind of, you kind of just do whatever you want. There's no middleman. There's no club. Mm. There's you know, there's just no formalities that you have to deal with. Um, that you have to deal with booking a show and that's why we started doing it was because shows were hard to book and and we wanted experience playing for people so there's no better way than just to go out there and play in front of people and see what happens right and your style uh, kind of suits for suits itself for that because it's kind of 
undeniable. Like people can't fight really tight vocal harmonies right i mean there's... <laughs> yeah resistance is futile <laughs> yeah i don't i mean you know it, uh, we we did a back in those days a lot of it was yeah they people mostly respond to singing a lot on the street when you're playing if you start singing in harmony it definitely stops people more than probably anything else mm. but between that and a really good groove you know, those are the two things that I always notice that when the groove really tightens up and gets into that juicy spot, people stop. Or when they hear vocal harmonies, they stop. Wow. Those Man. are the two things that really kind of create, they kind of create like a space that's bigger than the music. So even if you're playing quiet or whatever, if you have those things happening, all of a sudden it like, it kind of permeates the, you know, the, the ether of the area that people are in and they kind of get sucked into it, you know, it's right? great. Something, something's happening. Yeah, something's happening. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, my friend Matt Kilmer said some, when people have really great time, incredible time, something stands up within them and something stands up within the listener. Like, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, really, it's it's actually like a type of truth. Like, you know, like trite time is like you're, you're dividing time. All right, right, right. Perfectly, mathematically, or science, geometrically or whatever. Um, so, okay, I mean, you've kept, and your band has kept these, these kind of winning things. Another, another quality is that, um, street performers wouldn't be able to get away with like a, um, kind of monotone, uh, singing, slightly depressed singing yeah, style yeah, yeah, or yeah, something should, like that. It's that's not, not going to fly. Go, yeah. No. <laughs> No, no, you got to give them something to, you know, something to, something to make them happy. Yeah. Right, and you, you, you've got, you've developed those pipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so, uh, that's, you know, that's also just the type of music I've always loved. Mm -hmm. You know, something with a little bit, I mean, they don't all have to be happy, happy, but it's got to make you feel good, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to, it can be about a sad topic, but it's got to just make you feel something that, feels alive and feels uplifting in some right. kind of way you know sad and happy is kind of you know those are you know very kind of like basic things right well actually right. that would be a great time for us to to listen to something what, what what's the tune uh oh, that, that puts a smile on people's faces oh broke down that's a lot of people's favorite uh -huh. um we did it on this last record Bro broke down parts one and two people love that and it's a song that th the most people have come up to me and say, hey, I was, you know, they say, hey, I was going through something, you know, and this song helps me, you know, or that song helped me. So that's, you know, that's the best thing you could ever hear is uh, somebody who wrote a song is that somebody's getting something real positive out of the music. And that's the one that I get that mostly out of. And it's one of the, the songs that people request the most. All right, let's check it out. Top of the hill you see home. 
You still get something out of playing this song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still enjoy it. I really do. I like playing it. I always enjoy it. And, um, you know, it, it also, you know, we've been playing it for so long and it's changed over the years a lot. Mm-hmm. You can listen to, like, two other versions that are on there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just for your own shits and giggles to see how much it's changed. But, uh, you know, it's really it's really come come a long way. And uh, the words at this point is like, for me, it's like written by another person. Mm. So I don't really feel like I'm singing my own song so much anymore, right. which is nice. It doesn't feel like 
and when you when you're writing you're playing your own song you got a lot of investment about it like you want people to like it and, and uh, you know you still feel attached to the person who wrote it right but for me it's so long ago that it's just a song to me yeah i don't have that like oh this is my song right everybody be quiet <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> yeah exactly well and you know one thing that's really uh, enjoyable about your show is I kind of like at the end kind of different people kind of take the the lead you know it seems like um while you are tend to be the the lead singer like it it seems like you're not the front man because you have to be right like it's not right. like you, you you know you have issues and and everybody has to be looking at you all the time so i right i mean it seems like it's just like that's yeah that's, no we pass it around for sure yeah we love and we you know that's one of the things that makes it fun for us mm -hmm. yeah everybody every you know band the drummer loves to talk to the crowd and mm -hmm. hype them up and stuff and um and lolo everybody has a lot of lot to give out right forward you know towards the crowd everyone loves interacting with the crowd, that's the thing. A lot of people in the band enjoy that part of the show, so they want to do it too, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, we should mention that you're you're in town. I don't know if this will get online quick enough, but or well, maybe uh, you're you're playing with Bonnie Raitt a couple shows. Uh, yeah, at the Beacon, two nights at the Beacon on Friday and Saturday, and then one night at uh, the Knitting Club here in Brooklyn. And that's that's your your guys. And that's just us. Show, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll be going. Yeah. Have you, Four have hours you? straight, baby. Get ready. <laughs> you know, with Bonnie, we, we do this short. Oh, you know, it's an yeah. opening set, so it's real short. So we, we've been stretching out, mm -hmm. which and is what we always do anyway. But and and she's, heard, she's heard you play before? You've been, she's been doing this Oh, we've been doing a tour with her. Oh. So we've been on the road with her for a month now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's like our, she is our biggest fan. Oh, that's I think sweet. she likes us more than we like ourselves. Oh. Right. She's the sweetest person in the world, and she loves the band. Um, you know, that's the reason why she took us out with her. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, we've been playing songs with her on her set as well. And mm -hmm. So it's it's been a, a pretty steady climb with you guys in terms of audience. I know you sold out you sold out uh, Knitting Factory last time you were here, which yeah. is pretty impressive for uh, a band in that. California. Yeah. yeah. A, a band with California in its name. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't do that over here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it's been a, it's been a very slow and steady climb. Yeah, uh -huh. very slow and very steady. But we've been doing it for fun, a lot of the, a lot of the time, you know. And at the beginning, you know, we just we just made that slow transition. We played a lot of weddings. We played a lot of, uh, you know, just parties and just whatever. We went on a lot of random tours through Europe, like on trains, you know, before we had anything really going. We did a lot of stuff that was just for fun. We've never had a record label. And this was the first year that we hired a publicist, eight years after we started the band. Wow. So, you know, like, um, so it's been very slow, and we have a lot of very, the fans that are there are very dedicated. Most of the people you saw probably at the Knitting Factory were probably relocated oh, <laughs> from really? the Bay, you yeah. know? Because the fans tend to be really diehard. Right. And they tend to want to come back every time, you know? Right. Because it's always a party. We, we try to make each show different. And just trying to go with the crowd. Keep it interactive mm -hmm. like the street thing. Right. Um, as Just to keep it boring. So it's not like the type of thing that if you like us, you're not just going to see us once a lot of the time. You want to come back and mm -hmm. have a party again. Dance with your friends. Or just see what happens. Because you kind of don't know. We try to keep it surprising, you know? Right. Yeah. But you're not like suddenly going to... Uh in some, like, moments of, like, <laughs> you, or yeah. are you? I mean, you, you really you don't know. know. I mean, it could know. be, yeah. If, 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 if that's what makes sense. If that's what makes sense, yeah. Sometimes it gets pretty... Sometimes you can go out for a second, yeah. you know? You know, we all come from different backgrounds musically. There's not that much stuff that's, uh, you know, out out of off the, limits off limits yeah. yeah I mean a lot of times you know we're playing for it's pretty party you know a lot. although now with the Bonnie stuff has been very sit down crowds mm -hmm. so we've just been kind of playing music and it's all about just the music right and we talk to them a little bit and just keep them happy and keep it a little bit interactive but they're all sitting down there's not only so much you can do so 
it's been a really been very musical. There's been a lot more ballads, but mm-hmm. you know, Knitting Factory is probably just gonna be another uh, just a just a wild party where people want to dance and have a good time. So, right, you know, and then we'll we'll play things. We'll play free things. We'll, we went to Burning Man last year with the band and we played that. Wow. As you know, you can play anything there. Yeah, you really can. So that type of thing, you might we might just go to space. You know? the country and I'll play in every town cause I'm trying to find my baby but no one has seen her around now you know just where I'm heading if my baby can't be found The river and the river spoke back to me. He said, Boy, you look so lonely. You look full of misery. And if you can't find your baby, he said, If you can't find your baby,
on the ties Yeah All right, so uh, one thing I definitely want to ask you about is kind of finding your voice. Mm -hmm. um, how'd, that, how'd that process go? Because you got, you got a distinctive, really strong, amazing, you know, instrument there. Oh, so thanks, did, man. did that, how, how'd that is that, that's come a about? Very, that was a very that? slow process, too. Yeah. Very slow, and you can hear it on the records if you go back through all that crap might I might say on Spotify <laughs> there's some stuff that I really don't sound good at all you know mm -hmm. like I didn't really know how to sing so I always wanted to sing and I always enjoyed singing for myself and I we were we started out you know singing a lot on the street but I was just kind of yelling mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part trying to be heard and it, it took me a long time to kind of dial that back and figure out how to actually use my voice and, and was it from instruction or from listening it was, to records? It was what? a lot of everything. You know, I, I started out really, the person that really got me wanting to sing was Ray Charles. That was the moment that I was, I really got into his music um, when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And my trumpet teacher had played in his band and we got to talking about it. I was listening to a ton of Ray and I just started wanting to sing really bad because he's kind of like, I was a j I was sort of a jazz musician at the time, and it's kind of like Ray. He's like he's kind of between a lot of worlds in terms mm -hmm. of the way he does music, and it just appealed to me. Something about it really appealed to me, and I wanted to do that. But that that was it wasn't really the way for me right away. It didn't it didn't come out that way. It didn't come out the way I was hearing it, and so I took some lessons. I took classical lessons. I took all kinds of lessons. I s played in a lot of R and B bands. That was kind of the next step, was playing with a lot of good singers. I played with this guy, Jackie Payne, who was a great singer. Like a southern soul, rhythm and blues singer. And a lot of guys, this guy, Freddie Hughes from the Bay Area, who's, talk about an instrument, man. He had an un unreal voice back in the day, especially, but still today. But unlike anything you've ever heard in a style, really all his own. One of those gats, cats that, you know, really only got, only isn't like, He's like in the pantheon of soul gods, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, but just didn't, you know, get that recognition over the years. But um, and singing, just listening to guys like that that were really good, that kind of came out of the church tradition and did the whole Chitlin Circuit thing and their mm -hmm. style of entertaining and everything, that influenced me a lot. And and just hearing them sing in the van and singing songs with them, kind of, I started hearing how to use the voice, what you can do. But it took a long time, very long time. And, you know, and then eventually it's influences, right, the people that you love the most. So it would be Ray, Ray Charles or Claude Jeter is a singer I love from the Swan Silvertones, uh, old gospel quartet. Quartet, that wasn't a quartet, but anyway. And then, you know, Sam Cooke, too. Um, those guys, those are probably my three biggest. And Bobby Blue Bland, three biggest singing influences. You know, those guys, uh, they have really good diction. They have, uh, you know, just amazing technique, all of them, mm. in their own ways. That's interesting. And that's that's never 
something I really thought about with them with addiction but yeah 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 they have excellent you know the gospel singers a lot of them have like excellent addiction but yeah. claude jeter has just amazing you know all, all the but all those guys you know sam right. was sam was great and so was ray and so was bobby bland you know this you know you can just hear every word and it's and it's really nice and clear and and you know and then they and then the, and then there's that soul that sings through the music you know the tradition of the music right did your did your trumpet teacher give you any like inside information on like <laughs> uh, like Ray Charles like any kind of like stories he, or things? He gave that... me some stories, but they weren't good. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll just leave it at that. You know, like he told me stuff. He was, but uh, you know, and everybody who I've ever met always there's there's all kinds of stuff going around about the famous people. You know, not some. A lot of which don't need to be repeated. Sure. All right. Well, what, one thing I heard uh, on kind of a positive note, I would say, I I, I was friends uh, friendly with one of the Ray Letts. For oh a yeah. While. Yeah. Um, Angie Dixon. I don't know if you know, but um, she she was with Ray for ten or eleven years, and she said one of the tough things about being with Ray was that he basically had a sixth sense, and he would be frustrated that other people didn't uh -huh. and he could read your thoughts. So you, you had to be careful what you would think around him because he would say, now don't get all mad. Don't be pulling faces or whatever. You know, he, you had to be really careful around him because he could, he could feel all that. He could feel the vibes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, he wrote, he, he drove a boat, he rode a motorcycle and, and bicycle and all that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's according that. to his autobiography. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> there's a lot you can do with hearing that, that uh, you know, there's a lot yeah. you can do. I did, I did hear that he had a, an amazing ear, you what? know, obviously, but that yeah. it was like on the level of precision that was just unreal. Yeah. Is what I've heard. Like from, bring that down at 1156. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard he had like kind of like the golden engineer's ear. Yeah, you know, and and stuff like that, and I heard, and I heard that he was very demanding about the tempos and stuff like that, and he had a lot of people on their toes throughout the gig. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny. You sometimes you watch the video. I, I go on, you know, YouTube page to watch the videos, and you you see you see like the bass player just watching him as he's like rocking at the piano, setting the tempo. Yeah. You know, while he's playing, and the bass player's just on his every move. You know. Yeah. So I heard the trick was to to watch him tap where he's yeah, tapping. Yeah, yeah, so it was the only way you could go, right? Wow, <laughs> isn't it crazy? I mean, we do music for fun, and yet it could be the scariest thing. Yeah, in the that's world. what that's what everybody. That's the, the stories I got from a lot of people that people were like a lot of times just like scared, or like <laughs> <laughs> like oh my god, am I about to get yelled at? Am I about to get fired on stage in front of my family? Like right. when they're here at the show, stuff like that. Right. Yeah, so so you 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 guys do a whole bunch of, of of genres. You know, you get into the like. I love when you get into kind of the old school reggae feels like that. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Um, and but but they're all your compositions. Uh, all, at the shows, it's a mix. It's, it's a all mix. kinds of stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. At the shows, it's really a big mix, and uh -huh. everybody's got their own influences musically. So. You know, you mentioned the reggae thing, Ben, the drummer um, and washboard player. He he grew up playing mostly reggae and kind of Afro-Caribbean stuff mm -hmm. and kind of African diaspora hand drumming. Mm -hmm. He became he became a, a kit drummer just for the band. Oh, wow. He That's had cool. A little experience with that. And we were just like, yeah, let's let's try it, you know. And we didn't even have a kit starting when the band started. There was only washboard. So wow. it was super broken down when we started the band, and then slowly it was like a snare drum, and then it became mm -hmm. a bass drum and a snare drum, and then it became a hi hat and a snare drum and a bass drum. And we've never added any toms. Mm -hmm. We kind of stopped at the the basic the right. cowbells, cool. you know, yeah. snare drum. But yeah, but so so people bringing their different influences has been a thing. Nice, but you do you write you kind of I, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it seems that you you write songs in various kind of uh, genres and styles. Yeah, yeah, that does. Uh, I don't do it on purpose. Sometimes mm -hmm. I write, a lot of times I write, a, I just write the songs and then we put the feels to them later. 
You know what right, I mean? Right. Like the the van just is like, well, we could play it like this, or right. we could play it like that, mm-hmm. or we could play it like this, and we could do this type right. of thing with it. And we've you know we've been hanging out with each other for so long and listening to so much music, we right. kind of have a lot of elasticity with the feels. Right. And I hear songs that way. I hear them kind of like. I hear I had a I had a one of the founding members of the band that's not with us anymore, uh, Nan Samba, who used to play with us. She kind of had this ear for songs that she didn't hear them like in a genre. You mm-hmm. know, she didn't hear songs. It was like always like, is it a song? And I never heard music that way until I was hanging out with her for years. And now I've kind of like adopted that. Now I'll hear any song on the radio. I don't care what type of song it is. Uh, I don't I care if it's pop, country. You right. know, you get right uh, rap, R and B, well, yeah, whatever. I just like if it's a good song, I'm just like that's a good song. Mm. And then I'm just so we've all kind of adopted that now. Yeah, in the band. that's great. I, I feel like actually one of the things is like a lot of things we consider guilty by association. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So you sure. hear you hear a lot of like say uh, smooth jazz that really was meant to just be kind of commercial or something like that. Uh, and they'll use certain synth sounds, and then when you hear yeah. other recordings that use those sounds, you're like, "Oh, that's horrible!" Hard but work. actually, when they came out, none of this other crappy stuff yeah, had come yeah, out. Yeah, right, yet. right, right. You know, but like it's 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 you, you almost have to deprogram yourself. No, know? totally, man. Give I mean, into the synth, <laughs> give into the man, give into the saxophone. Even you yeah. know, for a generation of people. The thing, only thing they can think of when they hear a saxophone is Kenny G. You know? Right. Yeah. And so sax. people hear a sax and they're like, I don't like this. Yeah. And in fact, when I was a kid, I did not like the saxophone. It took mm-hmm. me a while to warm up to the saxophone because that's kind of, I always heard it with this kind of like whiny, super commercial, smooth quality to it, even right. though that's not the way people were playing it. Right. It was just like you said, the guilty by association. So I feel yeah. that for sure. And yeah. And, you know that's just our mind playing tricks on us right. that's true so. now yeah my last question i'm just kind of curious i mean when i i made a lot of my money i used to <laughs> <laughs> when i made money i was like doing wedding djs and and the thing that killed me was like that like everybody else was just partying like like that was what they did when they weren't at their job but my job was the party, yeah. and that became kind of exhausting, and, yeah, and yeah. just everything—the volume and all that. So, mm-hmm. so, uh, how how do you navigate that? Since you know your your band develops such a, a festive kind of party atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely it can be tough, but luckily we we have like a very broad range of fans. You know, yeah. like different people from different age ranges. And some of them like to, you know, and so we do shows for old people where it's like at a club with seats. Uh-huh. And they know that that's what it's going to be and that's what they come to. Right. And, then, and, and the same city. And then we'll do a same, another mm-hmm. another place that's for the party. Right. But what's it your... Keeps, yeah. It keeps us sane. Right. Because it can't I, just be one thing. Yeah, I love them both. But like you said, the volume and like the the job of trying to bring up that energy every day and like please all these people that are just drunk and like <laughs> you know i don't know it can it can be annoying and no, no doubt about it but sometimes it can be the best thing in the world it just right. depends on you know your moderation with it but we we've tried to make our tour schedule so we can do a little bit of both that's interesting yeah i i bet you probably have developed some serious chops in terms of crowd management you oh know, yeah like, yeah i bet you know what to do for just about anybody and how it- you know man sometimes there's nothing you can do <laughs> you know sometimes it's hard it can be hard still you know because we don't play one thing we don't do is we don't play loud mm-hmm. we don't play particularly loud as far as like right. party dance type bands go we play right. really quiet so when the crowd is really loud when they're just talking yeah that's a problem right you know because we're not going to play over that and that's no fun for us and we right. don't want to do it and so I just tell them I'm, I start getting on them about shutting up. And that could be That's difficult. I gotta tell them, hey, you know, I know that it's not 1945 anymore, and some of y'all, and you know, and I know that some of y'all are 20 years old and just want to get laid tonight, you know, and then you're not here for the music, but you need to go to the back, 
you know, uh-huh. and you can talk there. I appreciate that you came, that you brought me, a, you know, you bought a ticket. Right. It's going in my pocket. I appreciate that. But let the people who want to hear the music in the front, y'all go to the back. No talking. You want to dance. You want to sing. You right. want to clap. You want to do anything like that. You can stay in the front. You want to stand there and listen. You can stay in the front. But, you know, that's hard, though. That's it, hard. That gets works. hard, especially with young crowds. Because young people, they don't know. They don't know about music. They don't know about live music. Instruments. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they're they used to showing up at a DJ thing and just partying. So when they think about a dance party, they're thinking about going to see a DJ where they can talk. Right. They can just stand there and talk if they don't. Right. And it's like, yo, I'm up here. You guys got to interact with me. Wow. They're like, sometimes really young crowds are like, they're like shocked how much I'm engaging them. You know, they just want to stand and like watch you and be amazed and that's not really what we're into. Or they want to like sit there, stand there, and party with their friends. Right. And I'm just like, that's not what we're here to do. Like, we're here to do this thing together. And that takes some skills. And you know, I can't say I always succeed, but most times we get it yeah. going. <laughs> you know, you know, one of my my standard tricks is to get people to clap for something that they have to clap for. And most people won't even hear what you're saying when it's really loud. You know. Right. Right. So you 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 force them. You yeah, know, yeah. Let's give it up for mothers. Yeah. Let's get uh, the fire departments here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Whatever you know, things yeah, yeah. that you have no choice. Even you know, right, right, just to get them to all do something and then, together. And then, yeah, and then when they start clapping, you go into a song. Yeah, yeah that, that's like uh, oh, that's they, yeah, yeah. We do that. Yeah, that's that's true. We can get them to sing a lot. Uh-huh. I get them just to sing a lot. I make them sing stuff. I just right. make stuff up, and then they sing back to me, and that gets uh, them to focus. But I'm right. telling you, these children these days, man. They got short attention spans. You got to do. Oof. You got to be making up somebody new in the room every five seconds with them. <laughs> you know, wow. It can be hard. It can be hard, you know. But it can be fun too. And once you break them, you know, there's nothing like that feeling of a room that was really stiff at first. People that were afraid to let mm. loose. There's nothing like that feeling of watching them having the best time of their lives by the end of the night. Wow. Like everybody dancing together and just like. You can see seeing them make that like kind of leap, making like, right. hey, like I'm going to I'm going to do I'm, maybe I haven't danced before or whatever. Maybe right. I haven't gone this crazy before, but I'm going to turn around and talk to this random person and have some fun with them you know, right. and, and dance with them. That's a, a great feeling when you yeah. when you can break that, you know, that's deep. I mean, when you think about that, it's it's this it's the goal of the music is to make one thing happen. Right. One thing is happening. Every, we're all in this thing together. Thing together, together. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh-huh. deep, man. Wow. Well, I think um, everybody's going to hear a lot more from you guys. I mean, uh, California Honey Drops. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm buoyed by your optimism. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's like, how could you How could you not like you guys? You, you guys are like... Uh, Too likable. It's just I gross. mean, that, that could be it's the gross. thing. That, that could like, be the problem. Oh, stop. Big problem. Stop making me say yeah over and over again. <laughs> like, stop making me try to feel so good. Sing a sad song. There's right. nothing to be happy about. The world is ending, can, man. Can you, can you tamp down the soul? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went to that again. I'm tired of all this today. Yeah, I, hey, I, I wouldn't be surprised because everything is soul music now. Everyone's calling themselves soul right, music right. now. So, you yeah. know, or, or R&B influence. So, hey, you know, there's going to be a backlash. But luckily, we've never called ourselves either of those things. So it's going to be easy. Good. <laughs> Under the radar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh yeah, stay tuned. Uh, I don't know if this will air in time, but April 3rd at the Knitting Factory, Lesh and his buddies from the California Honey Drops will be, it'll sell out probably. It did it, last time. Maybe it definitely right. will. I would recommend getting your tickets in advance. It yeah. just airs. <laughs> and um, keep your eyes open, your ears open. And uh, thanks for your time, man. Yeah, man. Hell yeah. <laughs>
good all the time. Just one hit off a reefer is all this Polish boy really needs. Yeah, that's why I say goodbye, goodbye to whiskey. And so long to gin. You know, I just want that reefer. I just want to feel high. Ice cream and cake. <laughs> yeah, that's why. I- 